Hi guys, welcome back to Psychology. This is Miss Lee, and this is Unit 1, Scientific Inquiry, Section 5, Methods of Observation and Analysis of Data. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about a variety of quantitative and qualitative research methods, including observations and correlation. We're going to discuss what descriptive statistics and qualitative data are, and how they are used by psychological scientists in research. We will be defining correlation coefficients and explain their appropriate interpretations. And we're going to be looking at graphical representations of data, which are used in both quantitative and qualitative methods. We're also going to be explaining other statistical concepts like statistical significance and effect size. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your notes and get ready. So first we want to talk about the different methods of observation. It isn't just looking at something. There are actual ways of doing them. So there are six and we're going to be going into each of these in a little bit more detail. The first observational method is the testing method. So we look at different psychological tests to learn about human behavior. These could be a variety of different types of tests like intelligence tests, aptitude tests, and personality tests. Intelligence tests are designed to determine how smart someone is, and an aptitude test is designed to figure out how much knowledge someone already has about a topic, so they're a little bit different. So intelligence tests could be something like a Stanford Binet test. An aptitude test would be something like the SAT or the ACT or the ASVAB. And then we have personality tests that are very specific to just psychology. An example of that would be a Rorschach inkblot test. And this is a test that I have not only taken, um, but that I have a lot of fun with in class sometimes. This is a personality test and it's a specific kind of test called a projective test. And basically what an analyst would do is present the cards that you see here on your screen to a client and based on their answers of what they saw, they thought they could determine different aspects of their personality. So for example, in card one, you may be looking at it and seeing certain things. What I always see in this card are two baby elephants dancing. They're holding hands. Not that elephants have hands, but if they had hands, they'd be holding hands and spinning around dancing. I've been told that this pretty much sums up my personality. The second method of observation is the case study method. This is an in-depth investigation of an individual or a small group. We will be doing a lot of case studying in this class and one of the people who really brought this to the forefront was Sigmund Freud. He interviewed his own patients for many years, and he really looked very deeply into their past, their present beliefs, their dreams. Now, the problem with the case study method is that you get a lot of information about one person or a small number of people, and so you're really not able to generalize much. Does that mean we shouldn't be doing case studies? No, we just have to be very careful about the information that we gather and how we apply it. Other problems with case studies is that the patient may or may not remember details. They could intentionally or unintentionally distort their past to impress the researcher or the therapist. And sometimes researchers may encourage clients to answer a certain way. Researchers are just like you and me. They want to have their results a lot of times they want their hypothesis to be supported. They may accidentally push a participant to answer in a certain way. Longitudinal methods, when you look at the word longitudinal, I like to emphasize long. This is a study that stretches out over a long period of time. Researchers select a group of participants and then observe that group over a period of time, often years or maybe even decades. So you may look at improvements of language development over time. You can look at the, the individuals as they develop. The problem with longitudinal methods is that researchers have to be very patient. The cross-sectional method attempts to take care of some of the problems with a longitudinal method. 
Now, if you will think about how a longitudinal research study might progress, if you have a research study that is stretching out over decades, for example, what's going to happen to those participants? Over decades, you may lose some. You probably will lose some. Maybe some will move away. Maybe some will decide they don't want to be in that study anymore. And sometimes they die. I hate to think about it, but sometimes they do die. In fact, some of the longest research studies that have gone on, the researchers have died. So the cross-sectional method will take the same hypothesis, the same type of research questions, and those researchers are going to look at participants of different ages at the same time. So they're taking slices, almost, um, different groups of people so that they can study the effects of language development, for example, at the same time. So if we go back to that example, if you're studying languages, then you're going to look at maybe 12-month-olds, 14-month-olds, 16-month-olds, and you're going to look at them all at the same time. So cross-sectional methods have their definite benefits, but they also have some drawbacks because those 12-month-olds, the 14-month-olds, the 16-month-olds, they have gone through different things and they have arrived at the same point of time with different experiences. Even though a couple of months may not matter, if you're looking at certain age groups over a longer period of time, for example, someone my age, if you are comparing them to someone your age, uh, someone in high school, you're going to have some very different effects. I didn't grow up with a cell phone and you have. So the technology influence is going to be a huge influence in the cross-sectional method. The naturalistic observation method is also called a field study. And this is where a researcher is going to look at behavior where the participant is usually found. So you're going into their place. If you've ever been in a classroom where the teacher is being observed, the administrator isn't going to observe them teaching class in a library. They're going to come into the classroom and they're going to observe the teacher in their natural habitat, so to speak. The important part about a field study is you don't want to manipulate or control any of the environment on the part of the researcher. You want it to be as natural as you can be. So Another example could be going and watching the eating behaviors in a restaurant if you're trying to answer some research questions about obese and slender people. And finally, we come to laboratory observation method. This is studying behavior in a controlled situation. So this would be bringing a group of children in to look at their language acquisition skills or their social development. They're not in their natural environment, and it may or may not be important. Um, but in this way, you can control when you see them, how you see them, and the amount of time that you see them. Animals are usually studied in this setting. So if you think about how you would look at animals, if you, would, if you were doing an observation of animals, you're going to be doing them in a laboratory or even a zoo. A zoo is considered somewhere that someone could do a laboratory observation. When we are looking at the results, when we're looking at the data that we collect, you're going to have to analyze the results. One of the ways that we do that is through correlation, and that's just a fancy way of saying a measure of how closely one thing is related to another. An example of that is the taller you are, the more likely you are to be able to reach items on the top shelf. The hotter the temperature, the higher the ice cream sales. One may or may not influence the other, but you can't say for sure that they do. Positive correlation is a relationship between variables in which one variable increases, the other also increases. So people who have a higher need for achievement tend to have higher salaries. Now, you may have a couple of examples where that's not true, but the large majority of people will show that pattern. A negative correlation is the greater the stress, the poorer the health. So as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. On this slide, you see what it actually looks like. These are the correlation coefficients. So in the first box, you are looking at a positive correlation. So as one group of data points increase, so do the other. It's indicating a strong positive relationship. So a one, whether it's positive or negative, is a very strong relationship, but a positive is indicating a strong positive relationship as one factor is going up, the other one does too, 
a negative one would indicate a strong negative relationship. So as one factor increases, the other factor decreases. And then in the middle, you have no correlation at all. There's no apparent pattern, there's no rhyme or reason, and there is no relationship. The thing that you need to really, really understand about correlation is that it only describes a relationship. It is a descriptive statistic. It does not reveal cause and effect. One thing does not necessarily cause the other. All you are saying is that the two have some type of pattern, some type of relationship. And when you carry out a psychological experiment, you're gonna end up with a lot of raw data. Usually you're gonna have two sets, one for each condition. We're gonna get into conditions in our next video a little bit more. Those two sets of scores have to be compared some way to see if there is a noticeable difference between them. Often you need to summarize that data so that you can easily see if your study has been successful or not. Two terms that you need to know. The first term is statistical significance. This is the likelihood that a relationship between two or more variables is caused by something other than chance, so that there is an actual relationship and it's not just a coincidence. Effect size is the quantitative measure of the magnitude of the experimenter effect. The larger the effect size, the stronger the relationship between the two variables. So if you have a large effect size, if we go back to those data points, the stronger the relationship. So the positive correlation and the negative correlation boxes have a very large effect size in those two examples. Descriptive statistics are brief descriptive coefficients that summarize a given data set. That's a lot of words to say that it can be either a representation of the entire or a sample of a population. Descriptive statistics are broken down into measures of central tendency and measures of variability. So how much the data clusters around an average and how far they spread out, how much difference there is. There are three measures of central tendency and they tell us the following. You've got an average score, which is a mean, that would be something like a GPA, the middle of the score range, which is the median. So if you take your data points and you line them up in numerical order, the middle point or the average of the two middle points, if you've got an even number of data, is the median. The most frequent score is the mode, and this is the, the scores that show up the most. So it is the most common scores that are going to arise. You can have multiple modes. And that concludes section five. You should now be able to describe and compare a variety of quantitative and qualitative research methods, including observations and correlations. We went through six different types of observations. You should also be able to explain descriptive statistics and qualitative data, as well as how they're used in psychology studies. And finally, you should be able to recognize and define those different correlation coefficients that were discussed and explain how they are appropriately interpreted. In our next video, we will be discussing true experiments and how researchers improve the validity of research findings. I can't wait to see you then. Bye for now.